Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here today. So as the title suggests, today I'm going to talk about fuzzing the Windows kernel. Um, a little bit about myself. My first name is Yong Chuan, but some of my friends call me Yong for short, and Ko is the last name. I am both a security consultant and researcher with MWR Info Security. Um, whether I'm a security consultant or researcher largely depends on whether I'm doing work for the client. So when I'm not on client's work, I get to have some time off for personal research, and this is the reason why I could be here sharing today. I have been with the company since it started in Singapore in 2014. Personally, I am interested in reverse engineering, vulnerability research, and also doing the occasional malware analysis. Now, recently, I got interested in Sandbox technology and have presented on the Protected View Sandbox in the Recon Conference last year. So today's talk is going to be sort of like a continuation in exploring sandbox escapes. Here is the outline for today's talk. I will begin with an introduction which touches on the motivation behind fuzzing the kernel and also how we go about selecting a target kernel component. In the next section, I will talk about the architecture of the kernel fuzzing framework and also give some details about the more important components. Um, what makes this framework unique is that during fuzzing, it also performs logging, so that reproducing the BSOD will be straightforward in the later stages. This next section discusses the algorithms used during the fuzzing and reproducing the, the crashes. This will be followed by a discussion on the hardware that I use for this fuzzing and also any special configurations for the fuzzing. And finally, the next section is the most exciting for me. Um, personally, because we'll be looking at the types of BSODs that um, resulted from this kernel fuzzing framework. And we will also analyze one of the crash and see how this framework can be effective. Lastly, I'll end this talk with a conclusion and future work, of course. So let's begin. First, to make sure everyone is on the same page, let us define what is sandboxing. Um, our very reliable Wikipedia defined it as a security mechanism for separating running programs. A sandbox typically provides a tightly controlled set of resources for gas programs to run in. A uh, sandbox is implemented by executing the software in a restricted operating system environment and task controlling the resources that the, that the process may use. So in other words, when you put an application in a sandbox, it means putting it in an imaginary box with just the minimum OS resources that it requires to function. And sandbox is a post exploitation technology in that it does not prevent exploitation, but instead it limits the damage that it, the exploit can do to the minimum OS resources and rather than everything in a system. Now the idea of sandboxing an application is not really a new technology. Way back in um, 2006, Microsoft already implemented sandboxing with the IE7 protected mode. This is followed by the Chrome browsers four years later. And then in the same year, Adobe decided to use the same sandboxing in Chrome for this Adobe Reader. And as with all software development, it is one thing to have a really good idea, but a totally different matter if it is implemented badly. And this is also why Microsoft introduces the enhanced protector mode in IE10 in 2012. So this is the visual representation of what's happening in sandboxing. Here we have the user land and kernel land of the windows. Then we have the OS resources in the left side, on the left, represented by the registries, directories, files, and other running process. In actual fact, it is quite impossible to simply put an application in a, in a sandbox directly, restrict access to all OS resources, and still expect it to function as before. Therefore, there is always a higher privileged broker process that is sandbox can talk to. The broker process sort of acts like a gatekeeper to the sandbox request and maintains the sandbox boundary. For example, if the sandbox is compromised and wants to drop another binary to the startup directory, the broker would prevent that by redirecting it to the sandbox path. Um, among some of the among some of the functionalities that are expected to be unaffected in sandbox are those that are visual related. For example, in browsers, the user might expect to view the web pages in the same font both before and after sandboxing. And because font passing are performed in the kernel, 
this sandbox will need to talk to the kernel as well. So far, it becomes clear that there are two ways to escape from sandbox. The first way is through the broker IPC, whereby um, an attacker can find a memory corruption vulnerability when the broker passes the IPC request to run code in the higher privileged broker, or they can find some logic error to trick the broker to perform some restricted risk interaction with the OS. The second way is to target the kernel directly because if you can run arbitrary code in the kernel, you can practically interact with all the other OS um, resources as well. So as I mentioned, the idea of sandboxing is not new and after multiple iterations of, sorry. Um, yeah, after multiple iterations of um, code reviews, the respective vendors are able to improve the quality of their sandboxing code. Um, but the part they are not really in control of is code in the kernel. Right. So how easy or difficult is it to break out of sandboxing through the kernel? Well, here, these figures from the Pontoon competition over the last four years, from one in 2013 to six this year, shows that contestants are increasingly preferring to elevate their privileges through kernel. Also, on a year-to-year -year comparison, this chart from ESET shows there is almost a four times increase in kernel vulnerabilities from 2014 to 2015. So this kind of suggests two things. First, the kernel is getting a lot of attention from the security community as sandboxes matures over the years. And secondly, there are a lot of vulnerabilities in the kernel. So at this stage, I assume that everyone is convinced that the kernel is an easier target. But with over 600 drivers, by default, the kernel is pretty huge. So which component of the kernel is a good target? First and foremost, since you want to break out the sandbox, um, logically, the component should be loaded and reachable from the sandbox by default. And second, to increase the possibilities of finding lots of vulnerabilities, the code base um, should be relatively large and complicated. And sometimes uh, researchers just like to use their instinct, like what Katie said this morning, we're all superpowers. With this in mind, the um, Win32K driver seems to be a good starting point. For one, it is huge. Um, at about three megabytes, it is one of the largest driver binary in Windows. And when you disassemble it in IDA, and you see code blocks as small as an army of ants, like what you see on the right, then it definitely is complicated enough. And finally, the fact that Win32K gets patched almost every month should convince you that vulnerabilities are constantly being discovered. Um, there's a few more reasons in this post by Thomas on why Win32K is inherently an insecure driver, and I shall not repeat here, but it is very interesting and I encourage you to have a look. So what exactly is the Win32 um, driver used for? What role does it play in the Windows? This slide from Dave's presentation gives a very good summary. It is actually the graphical user interface infrastructure of Windows and supports the Windows Manager for the creation and manipulation of desktop, menus, cursors, and so on. It also supports the graphic device interface to output graphics and formatted text to display monitors, printers, and other devices. And finally, it also acts as a proxy interface to the DXG driver for DirectX drawing. From the user land, these functionalities are supported and wrapped by library calls exported in User32, IMM32, GDI32, and also the MS Image32 DLLs. Now, in the game of fuzzing, sometimes it is a matter of fuzzing harder and smarter. This kernel fuzzing framework that will be presented addresses both and is easily scalable if well, you have the resources and also the variety of BSODs that you can discover. Another important aspect but not, of fuzzing, but not always uh, mentioned and emphasized, is how to reproduce the crash. Relatively speaking, it is quite easy to, re to cause a crash, but to reproduce a minimized POC and to conduct further root cause analysis is the next step. Um, this framework performs logging and captures enough information to address this. Um, so there is actually an interesting story behind this research. Internally at MWR, a few of us saw a presentation by Niels on kernel fuzzing and got really interested. 
So we decided to implement our own versions of it, and as we have different ideas on how best to implement certain components, this eventually led to the presentation that James and Jody did at DEF CON earlier this month, and also this presentation today. And at the end of the day, we realized that different fuzzing implementations would produce different um, vulnerabilities, as we find out. The last aim for this research is just for me to learn more about um, kernel security. So moving on in this section, I will talk about the framework architecture and some of the important components. The kernel fuzzing framework runs in two modes, the fast mode and the reprogramming mode. The fast mode is basically to start the fuzzing, and the reprogramming mode focuses on reproducing the BSOD and also minimizing the logs. The catalog contains a collection of both system cost and library cost definitions or, prototype, or prototypes as some people prefer to call it. The fast values are random values that are used as the system and library cost arguments. And in this architecture, we treat, um, we treat handle as a special case of arguments because they have to be fit back into subsequent fuzzing loops. For each loop, um, a system or library call is randomly selected and together with the generated arguments, a test case is produced. This test case is now in a ready state to be logged, executed, and interact with the kernel. If the test case returns a handler, it is stored in the handler database and then reused whenever necessary. If it causes a BSOD, then the logs and crash dump will be stored in the respective databases. Offline, the crash dumps will be sorted according to the WinDBG information. So after a BSOD is detected, the framework then goes into the repro min mode um, to first try to reproduce the BSOD. This is done by executing the library and system call with the corresponding argument values that are captured in the logs. Um, in, this, in this mode, the fast values component and dumb database effectively becomes redundant. Another difference is that in addition to storing and providing, the database now also has to map the handles from the values log previously to the current mode. So this to ensure that the same type of handles are used even though the values might be, dif might be different because they are after all references to um, the kernel objects. Finally, this mode also minimizes the logs by looping the whole sequence of actions and filtering out blocks of system or library calls. Everything in this framework is implemented in Python because that's what I'm most comfortable with. And so for C compatibility, especially for the library course, um, the C type module is used extensively. Um, obviously, this is a personal choice, and the downside for choosing Python is that each and every core prototype and structure has to be defined individually. And this is very tedious if you want a high quality set of um, catalog. Alternatively, you can choose to develop it in C for maybe better fuzzing performance and also save some time in prototype definitions. The catalog component is the most important in the framework because it determines how the kernel is to be fast. In our case, we will populate the catalog with the library calls exported from user 32, IMM32, GDI32, and MS image32 DLLs, and also system calls leading into Win32K. By populating this with calls exposed by other drivers, we can also easily target the another um, kernel component. The kernel is the most tedious to develop if we are aiming for high fuzzing code coverage. In other words, to cover a, a wide breadth of coverage, ideally all the system and library calls should be implemented, and to cover a deep coverage, most of the calls should be executed successfully so that the sequence of calls are being fast rather than the values of the arguments. So this is as what um, this in contrast to finding overflow bugs previously. So by defining each library or system call, what we really mean is to specify the number of arguments it takes, the data type for each argument, and also any conditions or restrictions for each of the arguments. And we may also want to specify the return values, 
in particular whether it returns a handle or object pointer, etc. In addition, the, the framework has its own set of syntax to log the arguments information during phasing so that the system and library calls can be executed with the exact, um, exact arguments in the repo main mode. The main sources for defining the library calls come from MSDN and the header files, which is not really a big surprise. Um, but most of the system calls are undocumented. And in this case, the React OS is really a good source for this. And from this project, I really appreciate the efforts from these guys. If all things fail, then utilizing your Google form and get you some useful information. Otherwise, you just have to reverse engineer the binary. On the last slide, I talk about custom syntax, syntax used for logging. Specifically, this syntax flattens most Windows data types into these four, the hex, string, handle, and structure. Now, the hex rule is the easiest to understand. It simply represents all integer types as hexadecimal, disregarding about whether it is signed or unsigned or whether the integer size is a byte, word, double word, or quad word. The string rule is a generic rule for a pointer to a sequence of bytes. So it could be a pointer to an array, strings, or maybe it, um, integers. So we need to differentiate um, handler values from integer values because handlers are special references to kernel objects from the user land. And since we will get different handler values for the same kind of objects created across different runs, we need to differentiate this in order to store the same kind of um, kernel object references subsequently. This storing, providing, and mapping of the kernel object references are done in the handler database. The last syntax rule, the syntax rule is the structure. And actually, this is just a hybrid of the hex, string, and handler rules for the respective structure fields. And the structure by itself is represented as a string field. So here we see an example of the create compatible bitmap library call definition in the catalog. From MSDN, this call takes in three arguments, a device context handler, and also two integers for width and height. The, in the catalog, the create compo, the, this API can be defined as such. The handler up method will retrieve a valid handler of the HTC type from the database, and then the width and height will be assigned random values. Then the run test case method will invoke the kernel interaction by calling the library call. And then the new bitmap handler that is returned will be stored back into the database. Here we see another example in the create accelerator table library call. The second argument is a pointer to the accelerator structure, where the behavior field, the key field, and the identifier field are also defined. It then executes the call and stores the handler as before. This example here also shows that in addition to library calls, the relevant structures also have to be defined. So you can imagine how much work goes into developing the, this component. These test cases component is actually the instances of the individual catalog definitions complete with the arguments being initialized. And this is similar to the ter terminology between a test, a class, and an object in C++. In the fast mode, the test cases are generated randomly, while in the repo min mode, these are generated according to the logs in sequence. So here we talk about the databases that are used in the framework. The handout database has been explained quite extensively, so I shall not repeat them again. The log database simply stores the fuzzing log for each BSOD, while the dump log stores the system dumps. Mm, by default, the system dumps take a standard name. So offline, this database will reload and rename the dumps according to the failure ID hash string to prioritize analysis later on. The purpose of the logs is to keep track of enough information so that the BSOD can be reproduced subsequently. This set of information includes the order of system and library calls that are executed by multiple threads, the arguments, and also the return values during fast mode. A potential situation that might arise from logging is that the logs might be massive from a few megabytes up to gigabytes. So we need to be careful of what is being logged. In the framework, a binary template file is used. So 
instead of logging the actual bytes values, the offset to this file is noted instead. And as a further reduction, we may also choose to log the return values of handlers. So this is what a typical log might look like. The yellow shows the thread name. In this case, the test cases are run by the same thread. The purple shows the class method name. The blue shows the library and system call, and green shows the arguments and read the handles. For string arguments that are too long, we lock the offset instead like this. Otherwise, we can afford to lock the actual bytes. And then to reproduce the BSOD from the logs becomes just a matter of tokenizing the format and also the argument syntax rules. So as an example, to reproduce these few lines, we first assign the test case to the specific thread. Then we will call the appropriate method in defined in the class. This is typically the run test case method where the library call will be called. Or this could be the user mode callback where we would then have to hook and unhook the corresponding dispatch table entry in user32. Then we will retrieve the ntgdix create pen definition from the catalog and set the arguments accordingly. So in this case, it's straightforward for string and hex arguments. And since this test case creates a new handler, we need to store this object reference in the database and at the same time map all 1B00016 references in a fast mode to AABBCCDD during repromin, as you can see here. So in this section, I will talk about the algorithms used for both the fast and repromin modes. By now, it should be quite clear how each of the modes work, so this will be a very short section. In the fast mode, we take the idea from the Trinity Linux system call fuzzer to first run all test cases that create new handles, and then we try to populate the handler database first. This is to ensure that subsequent test cases with handler arguments would um, will be called successfully, and in this sense, it will trigger a BSOD faster. Otherwise, the catalog selection can be random, and then the arguments are generated from, um, from the fast values, the test cases log and executed, and this will go on until we cause a BSOD. In the repro min mode, the aim is to reproduce the BSOD and minimize the logs by removing certain test cases and check if the BSOD still happens. But as the logs could contain anywhere from 15,000 to 250,000 or more lines, we will need a systematic way of removing the test case. So here in step one, we differentiate between cases where handles are created from those that do not. And on those that do not, we remove certain blocks of test cases from this fuzzing group um, test cases, as we call it in sliding blocks of n over m. In step three, from the setup group of test cases, we also remove those that produces ref handles that are unreferenced as a result of the block remover. Then we can run the remaining test cases, and if it still trigger the BSOD, we can determine that the removed block is not relevant. And we will repeat this until the block size of n over m goes to one. In this section, I will talk about the hardware specifications that are used for this kernel fuzzing framework, the gas configurations, and also suggestions to scale up the fuzzing. Um, to be honest, the framework is running on the most boring hardware because that's the only spare PC that I can find. It has a quad-core processor, 16 GB of RAM, and runs only four VM workstation gas images. Each gas VM is configured for one CPU and two gigabyte of RAMs and runs Windows 10. And in terms of additional settings, special pool is enabled for Win32K, which is very standard for kernel fuzzing. And to save space, I use the small memory dump and also configure a map drive on a host to store the mini dumps and logs. And finally, I set the boot status policy to restart the gas automatically. So this comes in useful, especially during the repromin mode where BSOD reboots are very frequent. In, 
in a way, fuzzing is a competition where the person with the more resources wins. Um, most of the times, at least. In this sense, the gas VM is designed to be as self-contained as possible, so that scaling up the fuzzing will simply mean spinning more VMs, either in the cloud or with more hardware, which is generally more expensive in the short term. So if you were to scale up, then it makes a lot more sense to also implement a server client model to store the memory dumps and logs centrally. And finally, in this section, we will see if this kernel fuzzing mode uh, kernel fuzzing framework really works and also walk through the analysis for one of the BSOD as a case study for the kind of bugs that can be found. So here are the results. It is quite hard to, for me to pinpoint the exact period of fuzzing because of constant development, ring development and addition to the test case. And yeah, so sometimes I just start off with one VM to test the code and then I just didn't spin up more VMs. But very roughly over these eight weeks, I got 10 BSOD from my basic hardware setup. And of these three are used after three, one invalid read, four now the reference and two miscellaneous. And I remember that my first BSOD comes from one of these four um, now the reference after implementing only a subset of the library calls. So to me, it's quite encouraging. So here we look at a case study. I have chosen um, this one for a reason that is a uh, use after free, which seems to be the trend now. Basically, all the bugs are use after free. Um, so begin, this use after free is happening in the device log BLT object destructor. And specifically, it is reading from a free pool of B8538 AD88 address. We will encounter this value again over the next few slides. So we will just know the address from now. From the stack trace, we know that it's due to the user land request to transfer colors between two context, uh, device contacts in big blocks. The MSDN reference from the, for the this library question on the lower right, and at this point, we know that a destination device context handler, a source device context handler, and a bitmap handler are to be used as the argument. As I was preparing the slides for this presentation, I found that this BSOD was patched in MS1662. And from the patch bulletin, it should be a bug collision with one of these four Win32K related CVEs. Um, it is a shame, but these kind of things do happen. And in a way, it is good because I can now share details about this bug. With the framework, I can reproduce this crash and reduce the logs from about 15,000 lines down to just nine. And these are the binary versions that the next few slides of analysis are built on. Um, basically, this is just the Windows 10 version as per January this year. So these are the final nine lines of minimized logs to trigger the use of the free. The um, handle arguments for destination device context, the source device context, and the bitmap color mask are created in such a manner, shown in green, blue, and red, respectively. The logs shows quite clearly the importance of creating and keeping the database of handles so that they can be used in such a fuzzy manner. So, for example, the, the source HDC is taken from a new um, compatible device context, and it's also involved in the bitmap selection. This is the actual BSOD code block where the free pool from the device log BLT object offset 1C is being dereferenced. And since this is a use after free, we are mostly concerned with a few questions. Um, firstly, we are concerned with the lifespan of this object, where it is being instantiated, where it is, how it is being initialized, and how the free pool is being related to the object and where the free pool is, where the pool is being free. So to answer these questions brings us to the caller function shown by the function on the right. The bottom left is an enlargement of the code block that calls the um, device log BLT object destructor. 
in the caller function, the device log BLT object is referenced only in one other code block near the beginning of the block of the function here. And in the caller function, we can make a few observations about device log BLT object. First, it is a local variable, and therefore we will not expect any calls to allocate memory for the object. And second, besides the destructor, it is used only in one other location, which is a call to device log BLT object um, B log method. So this means that besides locking the, the object, the function must have been involved in the initialization as well. And third, we also see that the BLOG method call takes three arguments. And of this, the second argument is the DC object that is instantiated from the source HDC argument in the original BitBlock transfer library call. So now let's take a look at what's happening inside the BLOG method. So here we see that the BitLog the BLOG subroutine is another complicated looking function. But at this point, we know that we are specifically looking for the call to X free pool with tag to free a pool. So we cheat a bit here and use WinDBG to narrow down the exact code snippet. The plan is to insert a logging breakpoint at the start here and then remove the breakpoint as it returns. And then this is the logging breakpoint. Also, the logging breakpoint will, point, will print out the pool address that's being freed and also the corresponding um, call stack. And as you look at the call stack, we see that D8538 AD88 pool is indeed free in this method and specifically is being free as part of a surface object deletion when selecting a bitmap. Um, at this point, we'll now take a closer look at the relevant code block in BLOG that calls HBM select bitmap. So here we have at, at the address e, 2EC85, a call to HBM select bitmap is made. And from the arguments, we deduce that the BMAP selection is made from the source device context. At this point, we notice that the preceding code block is doing something interesting. At the address 2EC11, the ESI is pointing to the DC object instantiated from the source HDC. And further down at um, address 2EC19, the pool pointer is read from this DC object at offset 1C and then copy it to device log BLT object plus 1C. So this pointer happened to be our pool that's been free in HBC select bitmap. And if you go back to a few slides earlier, in the destructor, the device log BLT object plus 1C is also where we read and dereference a free pool from. So to summarize the cost for um, the use after free BSOD, the DC object is first instantiated from the source HDC argument passed into the PLG BLT uh, library call. This DC object is then subsequently passed as the second argument into the device log BLT object BLOG method. In this BLOG method, as part of the object initialization, the pool pointer from the DC object plus 1FC is copied to device log BLT object plus 1C. And at the same time, this same DC object is also passed into HBM select bitmap, whereby the pool is subsequently freed as it deletes a surface object. And then eventually in the destructor, the free pool is dereferenced before a subsequent second call to a um, HBM select bitmap causing the BSOD. So now we come to the last section. To recap, we have talked about how the kernel and in particular Win32K is an attractive target for sandbox escapes. We have also talked about a framework for Windows kernel fuzzing, including the architecture, components, algorithms, the current setup, and also configurations. The results from the roughly eight weeks of fuzzing is shown, and we've also analyzed one of these use after free BSOD. So for future work, I would suggest changing the framework to a server client mode. A server client model if I get more fuzzing resources. And I may also want to expand the catalog with system calls that have user mode callbacks. But on second thought, this may not really be a priority because 
um, Win32K may not be attractive for sandbox estate for long. Um, at the moment, Chrome has already disabled Win32K by disallowing switching to the UI threads, and it seems like the Edge may whitelist a subset of Win32K system calls soon. So it could probably be more worthwhile to expand the catalog for other drivers instead. Um, so finally, I'd like to thank News for his invaluable inputs and also James and Georgie for the friendly competition for this project. Um, thank you, and I will be happy to take any questions. Likely questions off the floor. Thank you very much.